kind of a business of specialist. So I, again, I'm not going to ask you to draw these structures on the test, but I did want to point out that they have various characteristics. Some are not charged, or the, the, the phosphate groups always charge, some of the alcohols are not charged, some are amino acids, so phosphatidylserine has serine on it, that's a Schwitter ion. <laughs> Their point being, they're very hydrophilic groups, such that <clears throat> phospholipids will spontaneously form bilayers. And this is our present point. <clears throat> So in a, an aqueous environment, which is generally what we consider life to be, phospholipids will orient themselves such that acyl chains face acyl chains of other phospholipids, such that we have charged hydrophilic face, hydrophobic interior, charged hydrophilic face. So this is what a cell meant. What, this is not. Cell membranes are made up of lipids and proteins. But what we get is a stark dividing line between somewhere and somewhere else. <laughs> inside of a cell, outside of a cell. Inside of a viral envelope, outside of a viral envelope. And Incidentally, it's the fact that there are two acyl chains and that one of them is almost always double bonded. So if I anthropomorphize a phospholipid for you, my head is the head group. My torso, you're, you're lucky enough. Matt, this time last year I lost a lot of weight and gained a lot of muscle, so it's always good. And my massive quadriceps would be carbons 12 through 14. Uh, double bond in the tail allows the overall phospholipid, if, it were, if there were no double bonds in the acyl groups, the phospholipid would be more conical. That double bond keeps the acyl chains from packing really well, such that overall you can think in simple terms of the phospholipid as a cylinder, or cylindrical in shape. So they're not tapering in, they're cylindrical in shape. Of course there's rotation about the single bonds, there's a lot of motion in a phospholipid. Uh, by there. And of course, in real world membranes, in viral mem uh, membranes, there are going to be phospholipids and proteins. So proteins can form complex three-dimensional shapes, parts of which, called the transmembrane domains, are hydrophobic in nature such that they form favorable interactions with the phospholipid tails. Chemically speaking, it's less unfavorable, but for our purposes, Hydrophobic parts of proteins like to be in phospholipid bilayers. Thus ends our foray into the atomic level detail of the three classes of biomacromolecules with which we're going to be concerned. Let me do follow up with one point here. Lipids are good at their jobs. Why? Of their structures. It's that head group. Let's roll back on more of my shoulders, I guess. Tails that form a structure. If it were different, membranes would be different. Life as we know it would be different. So it's structure begets function. Do stuff, be stuff. Store stuff, get stuff. Keep things separate from other stuff. Okay, so as we start to look at these molecules, I want you to have a feeling for why they are the way they are. Chapter 3, Virus Structure.
prion is a virus, a viral particle. A datum is a bit of data. The particle protects the genome, enables host entry. The genome is, of course, the uh, nucleic acid set of all the genes. The capsid is the protein package that surrounds the genome, and an envelope is a lipid bilayer that surrounds some viruses, but not all. So a virion is composed of at least the genome and a capsid and perhaps an envelope. Viral genomes come in several forms. This, I'm not going to be able to hide it. I hate your textbook. This is worthy of a figure. Some are single-stranded and linear. So you see up top there's a line. <laughs> Some are double-stranded, but linear. So they're two lines. Some are circular, but single-stranded. So there's a one circle. Some are double-stranded circular, so of course there are two. And guess what? Some are RNA. And of those that are RNA, some are linear. So you have a line. Yes, but and on the website, if, in case you're confused, they have a color key. It lets you know. Magenta DNA. Purple. I'm sorry, I'm going to be able to flip here. And then we have double strand linear and single stranded circular. Mm -hmm. um, RNA as a genome is unique to viruses. I mean, the point is, viruses are small, so they have small genomes. Those genomes range currently among currently known viruses from 1,200 base pairs. That's really small. I work with genes in my lab from eukaryotes that are larger than that, up to megabyte and sorry, mega kilobit, mega bases or thousand kilobases. Um, and those larger ones tend to be double-stranded DNA. DNA is just more stable, so the larger you get, the more important stability uh, becomes. And then, being small, they don't have room for a lot of genomes. So this figure from your text is contrasting the that number is wrong. Uh, the size of well, that's a very very small um, bacteria. This is kilobases. So even E. coli, one of my favorite bugs, is in the uh, millions of base pairs, 48,000 uh, in the case of phage lambda, which incidentally infects uh, E. coli. So being small, they don't have a lot of information. Thus, they need, they need host cells, one of the, the larger points. Sorry, one of the larger things. 
So, I lied, nucleic acids aren't just simple linear polymers, they are unbranched. They do form secondary and tertiary structures, so more complex three-dimensional shapes. And the way of rendering that in two dimensions <coughs> is this stem loop structure. Uh, and that, that is, base pairing can occur uh, at, at different points of a single-stranded molecule making parts of the molecule double-stranded, so it's hybridizing to itself as opposed to its uh, another, another strand. So this is all one molecule, and then that's a stem, that's a loop. There's also a bulge, which is a point at which you'll have base pairing and then a, a loop, but that loop base pairs to something else. So single-stranded nucleotides do form complex three-dimensional structures that do stuff. Catalytic RNA, transfer RNA, have um, secondary and tertiary structure. And viral genomes have proteins covalently attached to them quite frequently. There's a 5 prime free phosphate. That phosphate has transfer potential. Those transfer potentials are reactive towards proteins. You can easily cap a protein onto the end of uh, a nucleic acid. So double-stranded DNA may have proteins at the 5 prime end because that's the one that has the phosphate. Like messenger RNA, uh, free, or some viral genomes have 5 prime caps and poly A tails as well. Another example of protein being attached. The error in the text is somewhere nearby this place. Throw that up there. Proteins in capsids. So, so the proteins in a virus are structural. They allow for either encapsulation of the genome, we'll call it, we'll get over here, but let's do that. or host entry. or fusion in the case of envelope viruses. You can have the lipids in a virus become part of the cell membrane of the host by fusing of, of vesicles and proteins are involved in that attachment and fusion. Beyond that, there are non-structural proteins. These can be within the capsid itself or encoded by the genome, contain enzymes, transcription factors, the virus has to, upon infecting the cell, essentially take over the protein production machinery. They tend to have strong promoters and transcription factors that not only turn on the genes, but turn the genes way up relative to the host in order to outcompete the host uh, for messenger RNA production and then later on protein transcription. Uh, primers for replication. Protein priming nucleic acid synthesis is a kind of a weird concept we're going to do later. 
the semester. And all protein. It can allow ions through membrane. And then, just throwing in here, immune response defense. And my example from last time was the CRISPR. So that proteins associated with the repeat sequences allow the virus to defeat the host's um, Give you a little into the weeds here because bacteria don't have immune systems, so this isn't truly an example of immune, of immune response, but it's kind of an example. And, but the, uh, there are proteins in eukaryotic viruses that will defend against the immune system. Structural proteins form the capsid. Uh, if it has a um, envelope, it's a nucleocapsid. Capsids are symmetrical. Why? I'm not symmetrical. Am I symmetrical? No. Why are viruses symmetrical? So? So that they, so that they side can bump um, into it's an interesting theory uh, to make collisions with the host more efficient. I guess would be a way of saying it. It's easier to code. It's easier to code. It's symmetrical. What do, you, what do you mean? Like it's easier to replicate something that's equally symmetrical. Yeah, I guess that's true. They use repeats Nick. of the same protein. What's your name? Kyle. Kyle. I'm sorry, say that. They use repeats of the same protein. Why do they use repeats of the same protein? Because they're small. <laughs> 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 